ICO is illegal. And ICOs are a cancer upon the crypto community. They are a bunch of bad teams with no track history doing things which shouldn't be built, which is the reason they don't have competitors in the real world because no one was stupid enough to waste their time trying to build most of those things. Then they get overfunded with no check marks and no, uh, you know, no metrics that have to be hit. And, uh, you know, the best case is the ICO fails and everyone gets their money returned. Uh, worst case is that everyone overfunds the thing and then, uh, it fails slowly over time, convincing more and more people to put money into a terrible idea. So ICOs for the most part are where money is shifted from the people who come in last to the people who came in first. And so it's just an advanced, an advanced lottery ticket that wastes a lot of people's, uh, consciousness through mind space. So you'll have this conversation is wasting our time right now. Advertisements they buy are wasting our visual time. Uh, developers will be sucked into their ecosystem for short periods of time until they're fired when the project fails. And they, so China did good to ban ICOs in their current form where they're all terrible. And all that liquidity that would have gone into ICOs will now go into something that they didn't ban like Bitcoin. So the ICO ban uh, frees up developers to do smarter things, frees up advertisements to go to smarter projects, and frees up investor capital to go to uh, currencies which are more secure and aren't stealing the money from the people at the end and giving it to the people at the beginning because there's no failure, right? Like Bitcoin cannot fail in the way that ICOs fail. ICOs never get to market and then they just disappear. Bitcoin is the market. It can't fail. There's no, there's no like, uh, there's no market adoption, like failure case for it. Like we're at the very, we're at the very beginning, like only 300,000 people have Bitcoin wallets. There's less than 5 million wallets and contain more than a dollar in them. You can't spend this stuff anywhere. We're at the super duper duper, very, very beginning of this, uh, currency replacement of the new digital peer to peer censorship resistant currency of the people overcoming the government control of man. I mean, if, if the government controls the currency, then the government controls how much work you have to do, right? Like it, it, it's a huge, huge, huge deal. And because the capital class controls the government and prefers to have boom and bust cycle because the booms help them more than they help the little guy and the bust don't hurt them as much. They're still eating caviar, right? Um, so artificially low interest rates from fiat currencies creates boom and bust cycles, which harm humans because humans have a Keynesian ratcheting intelligence where we're okay with raises, but we're really not okay with pay cuts and we're okay with things getting better, but we're really not okay with things getting worse. And so it's better to stop the boom and bust cycle and smooth things out by having more realistic interest rates. You may have slightly slower GDP growth, but you'll have much happier human beings that aren't being ground up by the meat grinder of a couple extra percent of GDP growth, but some people have to get entirely annihilated. You know, in the United States, uh, we don't do paid vacation very often. We don't do paid pregnancy leave very often. We don't do vacations very often at all. But when you look at the rest of the world, they do a lot of that. And that makes America more powerful and stronger as a group, but individually it destroys the individuals. So the individuals have worse lives, but the system overall uh, is more powerful. So you could say maybe a couple generations down the row, down the way that'll, that'll pay off. But in the meantime, it's, it's really bad for the small people. Anyway, in summary, China, China banning ICOs is good for Bitcoin. China banning uh, currency exchanges, not good for Bitcoin short and midterm. However, long term, they're not keeping this. They're going to enact real regulations and then we'll have a more of a flourishing, just like in the United States. In the United States, it was very, very hard for Bitcoin companies to get bank accounts because there was regulatory uncertainty and no large bank would want to risk their relationship with their upstream uh, in order to put on one single Bitcoin company. And so no one could get bank accounts. Then everyone bitched and moaned and cried about how bad the New York regulation was, but they were all wrong and they were all stupid because the New York regulation allowed onboarding of millions upon millions upon millions of people into the Bitcoin ecosystem through Coinbase because Coinbase could get a bank account. Absolutely. Now, uh, th that's how I got in. Right. So short, short term and midterm Coinbase is vital and amazing. 
as are all of the other introduction points and onboarding locations that get you into the Bitcoin ecosystem. Long term, those things die and we go to a purely peer-to-peer, middleman-free, distributed, we don't need those central points of failure. So short and midterm, Coinbase exchanges are excellent. We need them. But long term, they go out of business and peer-to-peer decentralized everything replaces them. But they're a very important stepping stone. So, it, you know, China's uh, short-term and midterm result with banning of uh, exchanges slows it down. However, uh, it kind of amplifies some advantages that Bitcoin has. So Bitcoin's the only guys that have satellites and open dime where you can transfer coins in person, hand to hand, like a memory stick, but it's encrypted. So you can't double spend the coins. Like if you give it to someone, they really have it. We also have, uh, you can send transactions by SMS. So the banning and the, uh, the problems that cryptocurrencies are gonna have in China, Bitcoin is gonna have the least because we have the most advanced architecture and the smartest guys working on it and the highest adoption. So all that ICO money and all of that exchange ban money is still gonna be coming into Bitcoin but just through all the side channels and you know, peer-to-peer trading because peer-to-peer trading is not banned, currency is not banned. So it's gonna slow down like normal retail user adoption at the exchange level because they won't be able to, to buy in. However, it will increase the price there like it has in every other country where bans have occurred and it will enhance Bitcoin's superiority due to satellites and peer-to-peer transfer methods. So whenever that price goes up eventually that will route around their censorship the way they they, the same way they've been getting economic uh energy out of that country for a long time so they they smuggle stuff they buy mining hardware you know either one of those things allows you to uh take your wealth out of the remunbi and put it into something that is appreciating instead of depreciating so I, i think it's I think it cancels out short and midterm, and I think the Bitcoin price there is going to six thousand soon, like three weeks. Is my oh, guess. I agree. I agree. I want to. I want to elaborate on something you mentioned earlier. You said uh, they don't speak English. Now, yeah. uh, on previously, you've stated uh, uh, they don't speak English. They can't talk me into their idea. I can't talk them into my idea, which I thought was was beautifully said, uh, because uh, and that's how uh, uh, you know the world works. Or, or any any type of relationship works. Uh, uh, you know, when we disagree on something, we we talk about it, and either you you go on my side or I'll go on your side. And and China has always been isolated with that. Um, and I I, I I just like the way you stated that. Yeah, it's always going to be that way too. I mean, so every time you try and make a suggestion and make the world better, some exception finding jerk off tells you why it can't work, shouldn't work, and it finds the exception. Now, these exception finders, for the most part, are all losers because their exception finding has made it so that they're paralyzed and it's called analysis paralysis. They're just incapable incapable of doing good things with their life because they're just confused by, oh, it might not work, right? They're cowards. So I'm not a coward, right? I, I give suggestions on how to make the world a better place. I give suggestions on how to make your life better. I use many of the suggestions and they're tested and true and, you know, half of them aren't things I had to generate. Half of them are just parables and things that have worked for millions of people over thousands of years. So if, uh, if you want the world to work better, we need to speak a common language. There's way, way, way too much cost and way too much inefficiency. And the world sucks far too much from lack of communication and even worse, miscommunication uh, that could be resolved if everyone just spoke English. Oh, but Richard, you only want everyone to speak English because you do. Well, it is the global reserve currency and all the best music and movies come out in it and every new scientific document is written in it and every computer language is written in it. So if you care Uh, about English. The the majority of the top countries in the world uh, teach English as the second language. Yeah, and they should. And, and I would like them to start teaching it as the first language. And I know it's a crazy transition, but the world would work a lot better if we all spoke one language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. as a third language, that would be tough. Uh, pride would kick in. Yep. Uh, um, it, it, it was weird how China uh, uh, ban came at the same time 
JP Morgan Chase, uh, the demon out of there, and then Marco, his secondhand guy, also went out there and 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 spit their poison. Um, and then we see an article or some news that they were buying. Now I know Tone tried to play it off as uh, their ones an e ETN a no versus uh, an ETF a fund. Now they called it fraudsters and they called it uh, a murder they call it all sorts of bad stuff so if it was for their customers that still doesn't allow them to speak the way they spoke and then they say oh they're buying it for their customers did you see that article that i'm talking about yeah so i don't know why anyone cares about this um the price went up to 5,000. The market cap, which is really should be called M2, is it shouldn't be called a market cap, but whatever. Everyone's kind of standardized on the term market cap. Can you, so. can you explain M2, please? Sure. Well, there's the physical amount of currency that exists, and that's the M2. And then there's these other M levels, which talk about you know how much currency has been created through the giving of credit. Because what's the difference between an issued dollar and a dollar that you pretend exists? There's not really much difference. As long as people think it exists and they're still willing to work to earn it, it has a money multiplier effect. So your smallest base unit that then gets multiplied through all these other different levels of uh, fractional reserve is the M2 unit. And I'm probably wrong and probably M1 is some other smaller fraction, but it's not that important. What's important to know is that economists study the issuance of money and interest rates and money multipliers and uh, velocity, which is the rate at which money travels through the system. All of these things are well studied and they've been named. And so if you have a currency and that currency has a certain amount that has been issued and is available on the open market, that is the M2. And so to, uh, it's different from a market cap. A market cap is for the stock market and it has to do with shares. So how many shares have been issued and how many shares are outstanding and what amount of money has been given to the company for the shares that have been purchased. And so it's just the shares that have been bought times the price. And I think actually they include the shares that could be issued as well. But don't quote me on that. Go to Investorpedia and look it up. So the point is like market cap as it is used in the cryptocurrency space is wildly, terribly misleading. It should be all called M2, but it's even worse than that because market cap means for Bitcoin, how many Bitcoins have been mined times their current price. Now I can tell you that's an obviously stupid measurement off the bat and I should invent a word. I'll just invent it now, I guess. So the price of a thing doesn't matter if you have to sell a lot of the thing because selling a lot of it changes the price, right? So if I wanna sell a British pound and I wanna buy an American dollar, that is not gonna affect the price of the pound or the dollar. But if I wanna sell a British, I wanna sell a billion British pounds and buy a billion American dollars, that action will affect the market. And having a number to quantify how much that action affects the market would be totally useful. So right now, I'm unaware of a single word that describes the, the impact by which the thinness of a market will slip past what you tried to sell at. So if you tried to sell like 10,000 Bitcoin right now, you'd move the price of Bitcoin down 100 or $200 instantly. And then arbitragers would, would take that giant difference in the one place and spread it out, out across all the other places and it would come up a little bit. So you'd have a you'd have a two hundred dollar drop, and then it would come up a little bit as the arbitragers, you know, booked that cheap price here, and then sold the higher price elsewhere to even out all the markets. So having a word that would describe how thin an order book is, and how thin a market is, and how how much selling or buying certain weights screws you at buying and selling time, because it never gets better, right? Like if you need to sell a thing, and then you need to sell a lot more of it, you get fucked. If you need to buy 